second two lines and repeat after me and then we'll do the whole song through. Turns in glory, he will find us all. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. You were sent to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. You came to call sinners, Christ have mercy. Christ have mercy. You are seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Let us pray. Grant, we pray, Almighty God, that always pondering spiritual things, we may carry out in both word and deed that which is pleasing to you. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. I'd like to invite the children to come forward for the children's liturgy of the word.
Children, we pray that the Lord would open your ears and your hearts to hear his word today and to put it into practice in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go and listen to the word of God. Go and listen to the word of God. God has the words of everlasting life. A reading from the book of Samuel. In those days, Saul went down to the the desert of Ziph with 3,000 picked men of Israel to search for David in the desert of Ziph. So David and Abishai went among Saul's soldiers by night and found Saul lying asleep within the barricade with his spear thrust into the ground at his head and Abner and his men sleeping around him. Abishai whispered to David, God has delivered your enemy into your grasp this day. Let me nail him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I will not need a second thrust. But David said to Abishai, do not harm him, for who can lay hands on the Lord's anointed and remain unpunished? So David took the spear and the water jug from their place at Saul's head, and they got away without anyone seeing or knowing or awakening. All remained asleep because the Lord had put on them into a deep slumber. Going across to an opposite slope, David stood on a remote hilltop at a great distance from Abner, son of Ner, and the troops. He said, here's the king's spear. Let an attendant come over to get it. The Lord will reward each man for his justice and faithfulness. Today, though the Lord delivered you into my grasp, I would not harm the Lord's anointed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. from the west so far from a 
just as he remove our transgressions. As a father has compassion on his children, the Lord's compassion is on those who fear him. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam's Adam, a life-giving spirit. But the spiritual was not first, rather the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, earthly, the second man from heaven. As was the earthly one, so also are the earthly. And as is the heavenly one, so also are the heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthly one, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly one. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, To you who hear, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. To the person who strikes you on one cheek, offer the other one as well. From the person who takes your cloak, do not withhold even your tunic. Give to everyone who asks of you. And from the one who takes what is yours, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. For if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, What credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. If you lend money to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even even sinners lend to sinners and get back the same amount. But rather love your enemies and do good to them and lend expecting nothing back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High. For he himself is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Stop judging and you will not be judged. Stop stop condemning and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and gifts will be given to you. 
a good measure, packed together, shaken down, and overflowing, will be poured into your lap. For the measure with which you measure will in return be measured out to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that uh, persecution was a very prevalent reality in the life of the early church. So for being a Christian for the first maybe 300 years of, of the church's life, just simply being a Christian was hard enough. Just simply trying to exist in society uh, without getting caught, without someone turning you in, right? There's, there's always this fear uh, that, that some, something could happen. And you'd be faced with a situation where you would have to either deny Christ or be killed for your faith. So there's this ever-present reality of, I'm choosing to be a Christian, and I know that this is a hard choice. I know very well what, I'm, what I could potentially be sacrificing in making this choice to follow Christ. And then after Christianity became legal, there was, uh, there was a sense from some that, you know, as Christians, we've kind of gone soft now, right? Like, we don't have this ever-present threat of persecution, and we've kind of lost our edge in light of that. So there was a movement at that time to seek to be in union with the Lord in, in suffering and sacrifice, to be uni united with Christ on the cross. And there were a lot of people who were going to the desert, who were seeking a life of solitude and prayer in the desert, in penance and fasting, because uh, they recognized, like, I don't, we don't want to be soft. We want to, we want to genuinely take up the cross and follow Christ. Uh, there was also a great number of those who decided to do that, to seek this life of solitude in the desert, who sort of banded together into communities. Uh, and from there we have the first monasteries and religious communities in the life of the church. One of those who was a pioneer, one of the, the fathers of the desert, was John Cashin, who uh, set up kind of a rule of life for monks. And one of the things he talks about, though, is he cautions those who wanted to seek a life of, uh, a hard life of penance in the desert, he cautioned them about just going off and doing it on their own. He cautioned them about seeking solitude and isolation without having been first purified by life and community. So he has some really interesting things to say about this. Um, he says, talking about this idea of just going off and being in isolation he, in the desert, he says, whatever faults we bring with us uncured into the desert we will find will remain concealed in us and will not be gotten rid of. So it's essentially whatever we bring, whatever is in here that we bring with us into the desert, into that place of isolation, is going to be in the desert. It's still going to be there. Unless the purification happens here first. You know, this is similar to what Jesus says in the gospel when he says, it's not what comes from outside a man that defiles him but it's what comes from within, it's what comes from the heart that, that defiles someone. And certainly the things outside of us can sort of stir up what's in the heart and make us aware of what's in the heart. But fundamentally, that's not the problem. The problem is what's in here that needs purification from the Lord. So then Cashin goes on to say, uh, talking about, talking largely about the sin of anger, um, and impatience, he says, sometimes when we have been overcome by pride or impatience and we want to improve our rough and bearish manners, we complain that we require solitude, as if we should find the virtue of patience there where nobody provokes us. <laughs> and we apologize for our carelessness, carelessness and say that the reason of our disturbance does not spring from our own impatience, but from the fault of our brethren. As long as we lay the blame of our fault on others, we shall never be able to reach the goal of patience and perfection. It's really easy to blame everyone else for our problems, and this is a natural human tendency, from your spouse to your neighbor to your friend to God, right? We blame everyone for, for our own problems. But what Cashin is saying is, you can try to isolate yourself and remove yourself from the problem, but you're just living in an illusion. You're living in the illusion that you've acquired a virtue. 
when in reality, nothing has changed in here. Nothing has changed. The problem, very often, is that our love is too small, that the Lord is calling us to a, to a greater, to a deeper love of those who maybe tend to frustrate us and really get on our nerves, but we're not there yet. Our love is too small. And the Lord gives to us certain persons really as a gift to help purify us, to help strengthen us, to help us grow in the virtue of patience and of love. They're kind of a, a mirror which reflects back to us our own weakness, our own smallness, our, our need for the Lord. Right? But as long as the problem is out there somewhere and not here, then the real problem is never going to change. You know, stay tuned for next week when Jesus talks about um, what, what we should do about the splinter in our brother's eye when we've got a beam in our own eye, right? It's, it's the same problem. It's the same fundamental thing. This is what needs to get fixed first. I think this is the kind of love that the Lord is calling us to as, as we read the gospel and we hear hard words about love of enemies, blessing those who curse you and who mistreat you and turning the other cheek and giving everything away, right? This is, this is not easy. But it's this kind of forbearance with those who really try us, who are really difficult to love, that makes us perfect in love, that teaches us to love like Christ. And it's really easy for us to read all of this and to object to it, you know? When, when we hear uh, that we ought to lend without expecting anything in return, that we ought to give to whoever asks of us and do good to those who mistreat us, etc. Like, if you live that way, one could object. If you live that way, you're going to have nothing left, right? If you give to everyone who asks of you, if you lend and never expect anything in return, you're going to end up bankrupt and living on, on the street or something, right? If we give, everything we have will remain empty. Yeah. That's true. We will. And it's when we're empty, it's when we decrease, that Christ can increase in us. It's when we empty ourselves that we recognize what's always been true all along, that we can do nothing apart from him. It's only when we're we're empty that we come to recognize the real truth of the words of Christ. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But still, you, you could read this and hear about the kind of treatment that we're expected to endure, about turning the other cheek and, uh, you know, just all the things that, that we ought to suffer and say, this is unjust. This is just fundamentally unjust. Yes, it is. It is unjust. It's unjust that we should love our enemies. It was unjust that while we were still enemies, that God should prove his love for us in sending his son to die for us. It's unjust that after not just being struck on the cheek, but struck all over, that Christ should not just turn the other cheek, but turn his whole body over to be crucified for our salvation. It's unjust. It's unjust that they should take his tunic and his cloak and all of his clothing and cast lots for it. Right? It's unjust that God should pay to us the, the, the full richness of his love, knowing that that's a debt that we will never be able to pay in return. All of this is unjust. But this is what love looks like. This is what Jesus shows us love looks like. The life of Jesus, and maybe in particular the life of Jesus on the cross, this is the form of of humanity deified, right? This is what humanity, which is filled with all the fullness of God, looks like. Looks like the love of Christ, especially on the cross. And that's the kind of love that we're called to grow into. It needs to be clearly said that this is not at all to imply that we should allow abuse or that we should allow ourselves to be in abusive relationships or anything like that. That's not the point. The point is that Jesus is calling us to a greater love, and he's 
he's issued the challenge to us in this gospel to learn to love like him. All of these things are what Jesus does, most particularly in his passion. And this is what we're called to. Jesus is showing us the full potential of our humanity, the full potential of human love, when it's supercharged by his grace, when it's, when it's filled with his fullness. So this is, this is one of the reasons we need community. This is one of the reasons we need to be in relationship with one another, because there are others who will test us. There are people who will, who will test our love and who, in doing so, will purify us and strengthen us if we receive those persons as a gift of God and allow his grace to work in us. Now, the other side of this, the much more positive side, the much happier side, is the Lord in his goodness gives to us beautiful examples of what this kind of love looks like in the brothers and sisters around us. And the other reason that community is so essential is we need these examples, right? As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. So we need to be in a relationship uh, to have people in our life who are surrounding us, supporting us, investing in us, who are striving to live this. And who, when we maybe are discouraged or despairing, can show us what it looks like to love like Christ. You know, I'm, I'm a priest. I'm not married. I'm celibate, right? Uh, I would never want to or attempt to live my life as a, as a, as a priest or even as a Christian in, in isolation or on my own, right? That would be, be foolish to try to do that. I'm blessed to have, uh, there's a group of priests that I meet with every month, um, men who are really great priests, who show me what it looks like to be a good priest, to love God and to love his people. And, you know, right now, doing Exodus 90, I'm, every week I meet with a group of men who are striving to love Jesus, who are striving to give everything to him and, and serve him with all that they are. I need that. And all of us need some kind of, of support of community life. So I would encourage you, if you're not part of a community, I mean, certainly, here we are, right? We're all part of, of a community. And, and the strength that we receive from the Eucharist is where this, this purification needs to start. But if you're not, you know, if you don't have a relationship with someone who is really helping you to grow as a disciple of Jesus, if you're not in that kind of intentional relationship with someone, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one thing or a small group or whatever, I would encourage you to seek that out. It's something that all of us can benefit from and can be purified from. And you might have a couple people in mind. You may know some people in your life who you say, I, I want my walk with Christ to look like that. So seek those people out. Seek those people out and ask them to invest in you and to teach you and to encourage you and to walk with you. Uh, another great opportunity is, you know, Lent is right around the corner. It's in like a week and a half. Uh, during the season of Lent, as a parish, we have Lenten small groups that happen, that meet every week. that would be a great opportunity to try something like this out, to be meeting with people and praying with people and encouraging one another and following Christ on a weekly basis over the season of Lent to see what that looks like in your life and if that's something that's beneficial. So I'd encourage all of us to, to seek something like that, like that out. But, th but then again, on the other side of this, right, uh, as we, in our relationships with others, are made ever more aware of our weaknesses and our need for Christ to give us his love so that we can love others the way he calls us to. To not, uh, to not despair, to not give in to discouragement when we fall into sin, um, but to receive those, even those who are difficult to love in our lives, as a gift from God, to receive them with thanksgiving, as ones who are messengers of God who are sent to purify us and to help us and to strengthen us that we might love Jesus more fully and that we might love his people more fully. Because at the end of the day, what he's called us to, what St. Paul talks about in the second reading, is to put off the old man, to put off the earthly man, to become new persons in Christ, to be transformed, uh, to, to put on the heavenly man, and to live into the promise that Jesus has made to us that he desires us to, to, to be him in the world, to take on his image and to be human beings who are filled with all the fullness of God.
I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, God from not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things remain. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit, was incarnated in the Virgin Mary, and became God. For our sake, he was crucified in the Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have power. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. I confess one baptism in the forgiveness of sin. I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. This time I'd like to invite those who are participating in our CIA to please come forward for dismissal. <laughs> Friends, as, as we hear the Lord Jesus tell us today to do to others as we would have him, them do unto us, it's perhaps the greatest challenge for today's Christian and for, for the world and its leaders often do not heed this command. We pray that as you reflect on today's readings, you will heed the call of the Lord to love your enemies, to do good to those who hate you. We all struggle with this command, and so we ask you to keep us in prayer as well. Remember that we look forward to the day when you will remain here to share with us in the Eucharist. Now go in peace. We humbly turn to God in our need, asking that we might be heard and that his will be done. That all ordained clergy and lay ministers of the church may be faithful to the Lord's command to feed the hungry, shelter the orphan, and extend God's mercy, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That all elected to positions of public responsibility may be compassionate and just to the weakest of our society, especially the poor and the homeless, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That our families might be examples for others of the protection and the dignity of all life, and that reconciliation and harmony might be found in our homes, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That those who live in fear and those who experience life as a burden, especially those for whom death's door is approaching, might rely more wholeheartedly upon the love and mercy of God, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That those who have gone before us in faith may be brought into the peace of God's presence with all their sins forgiven, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Father, hear the prayers that we make with confidence in your unfailing love. Keep us steadfast in faith during times of trouble and hardship. We ask this through Christ our Lord.
pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. As we celebrate your mysteries, O Lord, with the observance that is your due, we humbly ask you that what we offer to the honor of your majesty may profit us for salvation through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right to give you thanks, truly just to give you glory, Father most holy. For you are the one God, living and true, existing before all ages and abiding for all eternity, dwelling in unapproachable light. Yet you who alone are good, the source of life, have made all that is, so that you might fill your creatures with blessings and bring joy to many of them by the glory of your light. And so in your presence are countless hosts of angels who serve you day and night, and gazing upon the glory of your face, glorify you without ceasing. With them we too confess your name in exultation, giving voice to every creature under heaven as we acclaim. We give you praise, Father most holy, for you are great and you have fashioned all your works in wisdom and in love. You formed man in your own image and entrusted the whole world to his care, so that in serving you alone, the Creator, he might have dominion over all creatures. And when through disobedience he had lost your friendship, you did not abandon him to the domain of death, for you came in mercy to the aid of all so that those who seek might find you. Time and again you offered them covenants, and through the prophets taught them to look forward to salvation. And you so loved the world, Father most holy, that in the fullness of time you sent your only begotten Son to be our Savior. Made incarnate by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, he shared our human nature in all things but sin. To the poor he proclaimed the good news of salvation, to prisoners, freedom, and to the sorrowful of heart, joy. To accomplish your plan, he gave himself up to death, and rising from the dead, he destroyed death and restored life. And that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again for us, he sent the Holy Spirit from you, Father, as the first fruits for those who believe, so that bringing to perfection his work in the world, he might sanctify creation to the full. Therefore, O Lord, we pray, may this same Holy Spirit graciously sanctify these offerings, that they may become the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, for the celebration of this great mystery, which he himself left us as an eternal covenant. 
for when the hour had come for him to be glorified by you, Father most holy, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And while they were at supper, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, taking the chalice filled with the fruit of the vine, he gave thanks and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, O oh Lord, as we now celebrate the memorial of our redemption, we remember Christ's death and his descent to the realm of the dead. We proclaim his resurrection and his ascension to your right hand. And as we await his coming in glory, we offer you his body and blood, the sacrifice acceptable to you, which brings salvation to the whole world. Look, O Lord, upon the sacrifice which you yourself have provided for your church, and grant in your loving kindness to all who partake of this one bread and one chalice, that gathered into one body by the Holy Spirit, they may truly become a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your glory. Therefore, Lord, remember now all for whom we offer this sacrifice, especially your servant Francis, our Pope, David, our Bishop, and the whole order of bishops, all the clergy, those who take part in this offering, those gathered here before you, your entire people, and all who seek you with a sincere heart. Remember also those who have died in the peace of your Christ and all the dead whose faith you alone have known. To all of us, your children, grant, O merciful Father, that we, may, that we may enter into a heavenly inheritance with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, and with your apostles and saints in your kingdom. There with the whole of creation, freed from the corruption of sin and death, May we glorify you through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb.
Let us pray. Grant, we pray, Almighty God, that we may experience the effects of the salvation which is pledged to us by these mysteries. Through Christ our Lord, Please be seated for a moment.
Lent begins March 6th, and our parish is offering two great opportunities to enhance your experience. The first is a retreat taking place Friday, March 1, and Saturday, March 2, before Lent, where we will focus on creating a personal plan for this Lent. The title is Return, A Journey Home to the Father. The second is participating in one of our Lenten small groups, which meet weekly through Lent, where they reflect on and pray with the Sunday scriptures. Learn more and sign up today after Mass or on our parish website. We are getting things ready for the Via Crucis this year. If you are interested in participating this year as an actor, helping with security, or if you want to help to set up the stage, please stop at the table in the gathering space to register. Everyone is welcome to participate. Don't forget to bring your palms from last year and place them in the baskets located in the gathering space or bring them to the parish office next weekend. Please stand. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.